a medieval moment. Feasting. Vest Hale. A feast was a lavish ritual banquet, in this case hosted by a monarch, bishop of the church, or other noblemen. Peasants and guildsmen hosted their own feasts, which were not nearly as elaborate. A feast was a chance for the host to show off his largesse and hospitality. Guests would normally include other noblemen of the same or higher social rank as the host. Thus, a feast was a chance for the realm's nobility to see and be seen. Though not an everyday occurrence, almost any occasion was suitable for throwing a feast. For example, a betrothal or marriage, treaty negotiation, a funeral, the installation of a bishop, a victory at arms, a tournament, or the celebration of the feast day of a particular saint of the church. A feast would typically last several hours, often until the last drunken reveler staggered back to his chambers in the throes of an ale passion or hangover. Until about the mid-13th century, it was customary for medieval feasts of the nobility to be segregated, as at English King Richard the Lionheart's coronation feast in 1189, where the women were absent and the men feasted together. The clergy in due order of rank, starting with the Archbishops of Canterbury and York, the two highest ranking clergy in England, dined at the King's table, and the laity, the Earls, Barons, and Knights, dined at separate tables in order of rank. The Great Hall was the center of activity in a castle or manor house. Not only did the Lord hold court here, but he also took his meals and entertained guests here. Early Anglo-Saxon and Danish halls were of timber construction, while later halls were of stone with stout oaken beams supporting the spacious roof. Early halls had large fire pits in the center, while later halls had large fireplaces, a medieval invention. Large and beautiful fabric tapestries decorated the stone walls and helped ward off the damp. The boards, or tables, were collapsible trestle tables, arranged in a large U or square shape, with the high table situated at the back of the hall, often upon a raised dais. Over the Lord's chair or throne at the high table was a richly embroidered canopy called the baldachin. The hall tables were collapsible in order that they could be taken down after the meal and stored away. Often one table called a table dormant or stable table was left standing in the hall to provide food at any hour of the day or night. The boards were covered with white linen tablecloths. Table decoration was extremely sparse since room had to be left for the dishes of food, the trenchers, mazers, and goblets. Along one wall of the hall stood the ombre, or dresser, a large multi-shelved wooden cupboard upon which the gold and silver plate of the house was displayed. At the rear of the hall was a raised balcony called the Minstrels Gallery, in which the minstrels, common musicians kept on retainer or more often hired for the night, were stationed. Upon their arrival, each noble guest was announced by the hall steward, then seated according to their rank at the boards on high-backed benches known as banquettes, from which we get our word banquet. The most noble and exalted guests sat next to the Lord or Monarch at the high table. Upon the high table sat the salt cellar, the ornate and often bejeweled container from which salt was dispensed. A common form of salt cellar was one shaped like a ship called a neef from the French word for ship. The other guests in the hall, seated beneath the high table, were thus said to sit below the salt, which is where that expression comes from. Just before or after being seated, squires called urers assisted guests in washing their hands with scented rose water poured from decorative pitchers called aquamanils. As professional medieval chef Jim Mateer, whose catering company Good Cookery catered the Alabama Renaissance Fair Royal Autumn Feast for nine years says, quote, Medieval cooking was not, as has been so easily assumed, a dubious practice that produced inedible dishes filled with strange spices and dangerous ingredients, unquote. According to Jim, medieval chefs used many of the same types of foodstuffs that we use today in addition to forms of food preparation familiar to moderns. 
The dishes and recipes they created were neither inedible nor dangerous, but extremely delicious and nourishing meals that employed the finest meats, grains, fruits, and vegetables available to them. Then as now, people knew what tasted good, and the sauces, stews, pies, roasts, and soups that satisfied medievals are just as wholesome and enjoyable nowadays. A series of two, three, or sometimes four courses were served, each dish containing upwards of a dozen delicious exotic dishes. At royal feasts, the main courses were broken up by many courses called entremets, which featured lavish spectacles, music, and fantastic foods called subtleties. At the coronation feast of King Richard III of England in 1483, there were three courses for the high table, two for the lesser nobility, and one course for the commoners, which in this instance included the Lord Mayor of London. French banquets typically ran to four courses, while Italian feasts could run to as many as eight or ten. The menu for the feast in honor of the coronation of English King Henry IV in 1399 contained three courses. The first course had 11 dishes, the second course had 13 dishes, and the third course had 19 dishes for a total of 43 dishes. And at the memorial feast for Nicholas Bubwith, the deceased Bishop of Bath and Wells, on December 4, 1424, two courses were served. The first containing 11 dishes, the second containing 16. At this feast, due to their status as religious, hence prohibited from eating meat, the clergy were served fish dishes, cod, haddock, boiled sole, fried minnows, perch, crab, roast eel, etc., while the laymen ate meat dishes, pork chops, roast capon, roast swine, roast heron, roast pheasant, roast partridge, roast snipe, etc. Dishes served at a feast were typically more lavish than most people would eat on a daily basis, and in England at some noble feasts, Few vegetables seemed to have been served, being instead replaced with an array of roast, fish, and fowl dishes. Typically, the dishes served to those not seated at the high table were a selection of those dishes in the three-course menu, including the most basic dishes. A fruit or dessert course would often be served last. And while not understanding everything we now know about diet, Medievals, too, understood that we are what we eat. Their dietary regimens were based upon the idea of the four humors, an ancient philosophy which held that human health was controlled by the four properties of melancholy, color, phlegm, and blood, which themselves corresponded to the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. Therefore, medieval physicians recommended that meals be organized much as ours are today, with foods easily digestible such as light meats, warm moist foods such as soups or broths or greens being served first. To open the stomach, spicy foods were also often served first. Foods that were harder to digest such as beef, fatty pork, or heavier fruits might be served later in the meal. When meat was eaten, it was normally followed by cheese, which medieval physicians recommended for good digestion. For the same reason, when fish was served, it was usually followed by nuts. Wines and ales of all sorts were drunk at a banquet. However, the wine was typically saved for last, just before retiring, hence a feast would typically conclude with a snack of sweet cakes or fruits and wine. At large feasts, typically only the highest ranking nobility were served the more exotic dishes and then in smaller portions. The idea was not to get stuffed by eating everything served, but to sample small portions of several different dishes. But evil hosts, especially noblemen, liked to offer guests a wide variety of choices, and noblemen were expected to share. The 13th century household rules for the Countess of Lincoln attributed to Robert Grosseteste, Bishop of Lincoln, advised that her, quote, dish be so refilled and heaped up, especially with the delicacies, that you may courteously give from your dish to right and left to all at high table and to whom else it pleases you, unquote. At a banquet, the dishes themselves would often be arranged in their courses according to a theme, such as all fowl dishes or all fish dishes. Certain foods that we eat nowadays, such as tomatoes and potatoes, weren't eaten in medieval times. Tomatoes, as a member of the nightshade family, were thought to be poisonous, and potatoes were a New World discovery. The ubiquitous turkey leg was also a New World discovery. As well, 
Medievals ate certain animals that in our modern era are on the protected endangered species list, such as whale and porpoise. Medieval chefs raised cooking to an art form, literally and figuratively. Peacocks were cooked and refeathered to seem as if still alive when served and were made to breathe fire. Roast game hens were cooked in three colors. Roasted chickens were made to sing and veal meatballs were cooked in saffron colored pastry to look like golden apples. Desserts called entremets or subtleties fashioned of spun sugar and crafted in the likeness of saints, allegorical or mythological figures were served the nobles. Between courses, spectacle dishes which often included subtleties and entremets were served, which also often involved music and drama, perhaps the stories of King Arthur, Charlemagne, or allegorical poems. After the castle's chaplain blessed the meat, the different courses were messed forth or served in a noble court by pages and squires, young noble boys in training for eventual knighthood whose training involved serving their betters at table. The courses were brought forth to the blaring of trumpets and scurling of pipes, then paraded before the high table, which was always served first. Only the high table was served individual portions. The other noblemen shared dishes called messes, usually two to a mess. Due to their exalted rank, guests at the high table were served double portions of each dish. The Lord or Monarch was served by a host of special noblemen servers. The cupbearer served the wines and meads before the meal testing them for poisons or impurities in a ceremony called the credence tasting. The pantler ritually cut and served his lord's breads with a knife called the chaffer and portioned out the salt with his salt planter at his lord's pleasure after dressing the boards in the hall. Before the meal, the pantler presented the upper crust, the choicest slices of bread, to his lord, hence the origin of the phrase upper crust. The sewer arranged the dishes on the board so that his lord could easily reach each one. The butler supervised the wine and ale butts. The venator secured the choicest cuts of meat. Wafers served the wafers, the thin sweet wafers eaten between courses and after the meal. The surveyor attended the surveying board, the table where dishes were brought for final prep before being served. The almoner supervised the alms dish in which leftovers were collected for distribution to the poor. The most exalted position, often hereditary, was that of Carver, who ritually cut and served his lord's meats. 15th century English printer Winkin de Word published a book of carving instructing carvers on how to cut meat. The surveyor of ceremonies was the nobleman who supervised the smooth running of the entire feast. Most foods at a medieval feast were carefully eaten with the fingers. There were elaborate finger rituals to prevent the fingers from becoming greasy or soiled. Two tined forks were used to spear pieces of meat which were then eaten with the fingers. Only the Byzantines, who brought the fork to Western Europe in the 11th century, and some Italians ate a whole meal with forks. Stews were eaten with spoons or drunk from wooden bowls called mazers. Most guests brought a portable knife kit called a chantelaine with them to a feast. The host provided everything else. Wines and meads were drunk from goblets or chalices. Plates were not used. Diners ate off of large three-day-old bread slices called trenchers, round or more often square-shaped, one trencher being paired and shared by two diners. After the trencher soaked up the juices from the meats, it could be eaten as a dish called sop. In the kitchens, which in early castles and manor houses were screened off from the rest of the hall by a wall called the screens passage, an army of cooks labored, often for days ahead of time, getting ready for a feast. Kistrons tended blandrets, large pots or cauldrons on a tripod, termed spits, and hoisted large cauldrons over the fires with heavy winches known as ratchet crooks. Scullions of forced to lay and endured foods, this last being the painting of foods with food coloring. Rotisers prepared and then served the many roasted meats, and saucers prepared the stews, bruits, and gravies. Finally, common kitchen boys fetched and sharpened the many knives and cleavers, among them the large cleavers called flesh hooks. All were supervised by the chief cook and his assistant.
At meals in, the boards were cleared of food, with leftovers going into the alms dish, and they were taken down to make more room for the entertainers, who might already have been performing between courses. The Lord might be entertained by a host of performers, including mummers or traveling actors, jongleurs, wandering jugglers and tumblers, who also performed tricks with trained animals. The court fool might amuse the Lord with his or her witless buffoonery. Mayhap the aforementioned minstrels would play the latest Aquitanian dance tunes on their harps, recorders, rebex, violas, crumshorns, lutes, and acres, and bagpipes. Perhaps troubadours or menacingers, noblemen musicians, would favor the Lord with their selections, or perhaps the waferers would juggle their wafers. Often guests were expected to perform spontaneous songs or verses, which were sometimes written on the bottom of the small dessert platters called rondelles. This has been a medieval moment with Lee Freeman. For more information on a variety of medieval topics, check out Medieval Speak, a medieval word book by Lee Freeman.